First of all, um, I just want to thank the Texas Bitcoin Conference for allowing me to be here. Uh, it's a, an honor and a privilege to be back in Austin. It's been way too long, seven or eight years. I think South by Southwest was the last time I was here. So I hear it's changed a lot in eight years, and hopefully I'll get back. So last time I remember, don't remember much. I was drinking a lot, very heavily. Um, I, I think I saw... Um, oh, I actually, I don't remember what bands I saw. I saw a lot of them, but uh, probably due to the alcohol. Um, but my name is Ija, and, um, and as uh, the gentleman just said, um, I've done a lot. So made Grand Theft Auto V, speak at DEF CON, throw parties at DEF CON. That's been really fun. Um, made Demon Saw, uh, which has launched four years at DEF CON. It's a free uh, communications and file sharing app that's totally secure. It's secure by default, and there's, there's no peer-to-peer. So it's decentralized without peer-to-peer. -peer. And this, is, this has been my journey for the past four years, to, to flip technology on its head and find out if we could do things slightly different and achieve better results. And I was successful enough with Demon Saw so that I thought, you know, what if we, what if we could focus on privacy for all? Privacy on the blockchain, powered by the technology that makes the blockchain um, so exciting uh, for financial ledgers and financial transactions but enable it for privacy and secure comms. And so I'm starting a new company right now. Actually, it's already started. And we're building out a new decentralized network called Promether. And this takes the uh, power of decentralized networks, so secure communications, uh, anonymity, secure file sharing, and merges it with the blockchain, with all the incentivization of a token-based model and a coin in order to expand the capacity with a proof-of-stake model. So I'll talk about more of that in the end. And of course, it will all be open source. It will all be free to the world and hopefully ICO funded. And, um, but I'll talk more about that at the end. What I wanted to get into now is I want to talk about privacy and basic human rights. Because right now, when you look at the blockchain and you look at blockchain applications, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, Dash, the list goes on and on. All you need to look at is the ICO of the day and see what they're trying to do. It's primarily financial ledger based. The blockchain right now is primarily used, even smart contracts are primarily used for financial ledger. And so privacy. This is a great quote from uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis in her book, Queer Privacy. Privacy, what is it? It's the right to consent, but it's also the right to withdraw consent. How many of you signed up for Facebook, and you don't have to raise your hand, I don't wanna you know, dox yourself, but how many of you have a Facebook or a Twitter or an Instagram or a Medium account or you name it? Some cloud-based account, a Dropbox, an AWS, whatever. Well, what you do, there's one brave soul raises his hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, what you do is you, you give up your consent and you give up your control. And if you've ever read their terms of service or their EULAs, you know that it's kind of like in the South Park episode. Um, you really give up all of your control. And it, it's sad what's happening. So privacy is our ability to consent to and the removal of our personal information. This is missing in today's world. Everybody has the right, at least in this country, um, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of the press, the right to uh, assembly, the right to a fair trial by jury, by our peers, you know, the right to form a militia and keep and bear arms. This is especially important in Texas, uh, which is a very red state still, even in Austin, which is kind of the blue heart of the red state. But um, these are our rights as citizens of this great country. What about the right to privacy? We have no right to privacy in this country. And I don't think any country in the world has a right to privacy. We should. Europe. Europe? They just passed a bill of Thank you, Ladar. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, the right to privacy is something that's very passionate for me as the creator of Demon Saw and as the creator of Prometheus. We need it. We need more of it. So if we look at the internet, we look at the history of the internet, most people don't realize that when Tim Berners-Lee originally had the idea of the internet and this distributed connection, interleaking of computers, it was based around a decentralized design. This is a great quote, by the way, from Benjamin Franklin. Make yourself sheep and the wolves will eat you. Um, but the internet was actually founded as a, centralized net, as a decentralized network. Uh, if you look at how the topology of the internet is structured today, it's a group of, of, of interconnected decentralized nodes that work together for better or for worse. We have since built a centralized architecture and, decent, and distributed architectures or mesh-based networks on top of that. 
So most people, when they think of the internet today, I mean, we're not talking about computer scientists with PhDs. We're talking about the 99.9% .9 of people that use the internet. They think of it from a centralized standpoint because that's what corporations and that's what societies and governments have pushed upon us. Well, centralization is an interesting concept. We're going to talk about it just for a couple minutes, but um, there's a little quote that I came up with, which I don't know it's, if it's good or bad. You can be the judge. But the shortest distance between two points has always been a straight line, unless you have a warp drive. That's, that's a, in your folding space. That's, that's, we're not talking about warp drives today. Um, I'm sorry, I watched too much Rick and Morty recently. So, um, so the shortest distance between two points is always a straight line, not a Merkel tree. And I thought this was a really, really interesting quote that I came up with because sometimes we can overly complicate designs. And there's power in simplicity. So centralization is good for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, simple, uh, centralization is a simple architecture, right? You've got straight lines. It's simple for a lot of reasons. There's reasons why AWS is a centralized architecture, why Dropbox, why Skype, um, uh, to a certain degree why, um, why you know, secure communication apps are, are you know, centralized, why we go through Google Hangouts, why we have Facebook, why we have Twitter, why we have all these centralized apps, is you can scale their performance, um, there's an ROI, and companies make a ton of money. Last year, AWS made about $15 billion. Uh, Dropbox made a billion. Microsoft Azure, and I'm sure that's not how you pronounce it, but that's how I pronounce it, made 2.5 billion. Azure, I don't, I don't even know how to pronounce it. But Azure, did I get it right? Okay, so I, I speak multiple languages, so I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm uh, kind of not speaking certain words properly. But they make billions and billions of dollars over collecting our information. Greed is good. We live in a capitalistic society. That's, that's what uh, Gordon Gecko on Wall Street said. We are incentivized to be greedy in this, company, in this country. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have to pay our mortgages. We have to pay our electricity bills. Centralization empowers companies to make a lot of money. It, it, it empowers them to control our data. It's a convenient architecture and simple to maintain and manage and grow out. And like I said, it makes them a lot of money. Companies don't want the blockchain, at least not yet, not until we convince them how they can save more money and make, uh, make additional money on top of that. But not only that, governments love centralization. Why? Because they backdoor our data. There's a reason why Signal has a closed infrastructure. There's a reason why PRISM ever happened. Because companies, when threatened with their financial survival, will give in to the, the tyranny of governments. It happens all the time. Apple caved, Microsoft caved, Amazon caved, everybody caves. At the end of the day, Tim Cook, a super chill, cool guy, can sit there and say, I believe in privacy, I believe in freedom. But when his board of directors look at him and say, you're out of a job unless we backdoor our operating system, he backdoors his operating system. That's the way it works. That's how reality happens. So centralization is bad because we are the product. We're either paying with our wallets or we're paying with our information, but we are the product. There is no such thing as free on the open internet. It doesn't exist. Um, companies can be the judge, jury, and executioner. How many of you have heard of a friend who had his or her Reddit account banned or Facebook account banned or Twitter account banned just because they posted something that maybe a small percentage of people would feel uncomfortable? All right, happens all the time. Is that right? It's irrelevant because we've given that control to centralized authorities to be able to ban that. So we shouldn't be upset and we shouldn't complain when we give control over to centralized entities and they choose to be judge, jury, and executioner, and it's to our disliking. Who benefits from this? Well, it's really simple. The majority of centralization benefits companies, governments, and hackers. I'll go through that. Why do companies benefit? Money, Gordon Gecko. Why do governments benefit? Backdoor, tons of data, like CISA. CISA is a law that was just passed that incentivizes companies to freely give up our personal information without it violating their EULAs. Why do hackers benefit? I call it the potato chip model. So it's a great little analogy. 
I, if I had a million dollars right now and I said, who would run a mile for this million dollars right here in this briefcase? Pretend there's a briefcase right here. Who would do it? I mean, honestly. Okay. I think everybody in this room, whether we never ran a mile in our life or whether we do it every day, would run, right? Now, what if I said, I will give you this potato chip if you run a mile? Who would run that same mile? Okay, all right. Well, all right. So, a lot less. <laughs> so, that's who benefits is a hacker has access, one hack can reveal 50 million records. Um, it's really difficult as a hacker. Remember yesterday we talked about hackers and programmers being inherently lazy. Not lazy in a bad sense, lazy just in a straightest path between you know, two points is, is the line. Um, why would we want to do something more difficult, hack 50 different computers, 50 million different computers for 50 million records when we could hack one computer for 50 million records? So centralization empowers the hackers, and at the very, very end, the little guy is us. Every now and then, centralization gives us extra convenience. Say the lie of centralization, the lie of the cloud is convenience. We don't need companies and governments to keep us safe, and we don't need their cloud-based centralized software to give us convenience. That is the lie we've been sold and pay for every month with our AWS subscriptions, our Dropbox subscriptions, our iCloud subscriptions, et cetera. Convenience is the lie they sell us. We can have more convenience without the cloud. So decentralization, well, this must be the savior, right? Wrong. Decentralization by itself, um, and I did a Richard Stallman uh, quote here, <laughs> a couple of woos in the audience. So free is in freedom, not as in free beer. Well, one of the one of the benefits, but also the challenges of free and open software is, and I had a conversation with a group uh, of, uh, of young people last night about this, is that when we're given freedom, we're given the freedom to choose differently. So why are there a billion different Linux distros? Why are there a billion different uh, X windows? Uh, you know, Cinnamon, Mint, Mate, uh, KDE, Gnome, one, two, three, um, what plasma, the list goes on and on. Why are, we, why are there so many of these? Because we have the freedom to do slightly differently. We have the freedom to fork. We have this, that, and that, that is why there are so many Linux distros. But that's not a bad thing because that empowers people. So decentralization is good because it removes single points of failure. So the blockchain is a very decentralized network. It removes single points of failure, which enables fault tolerance, enables redundancy, um, and it also prevents activities that are not in the best interest of the network. It also removes the authoritative control, so centralized companies cannot be judge, jury, and executional, executioner. And it also removes the financial incentives which encourage greed. It also protects anonymity and privacy by hiding the true identity of the, the individuals using it. Oh, and by the way, there's a little Obi-Wan Kenobi Lego because he's fighting for good. Um, <laughs> But decentralization is also bad. And this is what most people don't realize. We can't simply embrace it and say it is the savior of all of humankind. Decentralization is far more complex from a design standpoint, as we all know with the blockchain. There's performance problems. Uh, proof of work is not scalable. That's a problem, right? Proof of work is inherently non-scalable. It will not grow as the demand of Bitcoin grows. It won't, ever. Ever, ever, ever. Um, I think I was watching the Bitcoin video, the Bitcoin documentary on Netflix, and there was uh, a point at it where uh, Satoshi was pleading with Julian Assange and said, don't promote Bitcoin for WikiLeaks. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not ready. Of course, every programmer will say that, right? Every programmer will be, it's not, re it's not ready. Well, it's, it's ready when, the, when everybody embraces it as a viable technology. Um, but Assange released it anyway, promoted Bitcoin to finance WikiLeaks, and Bitcoin still isn't ready. It may never be ready, who knows? But hosting costs, amortization, proof of work systems, so just because we can build something doesn't necessarily mean we should. So what is our motivation? What is our motivation for embracing the blockchain? We all love Bitcoin, we all love crypto. What is our motivation for embracing this new technology? Merkle trees and you know, the hash-based Merkle trees and the, the empower that, the, that they give us, um, financial independence. Um, 
is it merely to make money or is it something greater? Because right now, if you look at blockchain-based apps, more and more apps are coming out that aren't just financial ledgers. But the majority of them right now that use the blockchain are about financial ledgers. Even Ethereum smart contracts, there is no killer app yet for Ethereum. There's a bunch of ICOs, and a bunch of people have made lots of money by ICOing on, as ECR20s on the Ethereum network, but it's still financial ledgers. So the people that make money right now, and keep in mind, greed is not bad, but the people that are benefiting from the blockchain right now are the exchanges, the miners, and the investors. What about the 99.9% .9 of humanity that don't have wallets? What about the, the people that are political dissidents or the missionaries or um, the people in corrupt third world countries that are being um, hunted by their government and facing execution? What about their right to secure communications? What about their right to privacy? What about their right to anonymity? How is the blockchain helping them? I would argue it's not yet but I would argue it could. Um, so we need something free, open, and better than the current blockchain. We need something broader, something with bigger goals and aspirations. We need something more along the lines of a human blockchain is what we need. So if you go back to the tenets of decentralization as an architecture, the good and bad, I've broken it down into really three high-level points. I believe everyone has the right to privacy. I believe free and open systems should not charge people to use it. So this is the GNU GPL model that we're familiar with Linux. And I believe that there's no technical limitation preventing systems from being free and open. Why can't we have a blockchain-based decentralized network that promotes privacy delivers secure communications, has built-in anonymity for all with open APIs that allows anybody to write applications that run on this network while incentivizing people to contribute capacity to the network via a token-based model that rewards financially. So instead of the miners brute forcing hashes in a proof of work system only for the sake of wasting energy and receiving additional coins as rewards, what if those nodes in the network contributed to the ability of you and I to send encrypted message to, to one another and avoid government surveillance and enabled anonymity so we wouldn't have to use government-sponsored projects like Signal or Tor? What if we did the same thing that the US government does with tax incentives and we incentivize people to contribute to the greater good of humankind, the human blockchain, while also allowing them uh, a reward, a financial reward. We could do both at once. So this was an interesting quote from Dragon Age 2. As, as, a, as a game programmer, you know, I, I try to play a lot of games. Um, Flemeth, you know, one of the shapeshifters in that game, said that, you know, we stand upon the precipice of change. The world fears the inevitable plummet into the abyss. Watch for that moment. And when it comes, do not hesitate to leap. It is only when you fall that you learn whether you can fly. We stand on that precipice today. So let's create a better blockchain. Let's create a better decentralized network. Let's give everybody what they want and what they need. The incentivization, but also privacy, security, anonymity. Um, secure by design, you know, these are just some bullet points. It's proof of stake architecture is a must. We have to go to it. It's like what Vitalik said in his uh, plasma white paper recently. Proof of stake is the model we have to go to. Proof of work is flawed. Um, now, we're not going to get there for years with Ethereum, but people, smart, smart people, are leading that fight right now. Um, so I'm proposing a blockchain based network called Prometheur. Um, that will be open source, that I will be doing an ICO on, that will adhere to SEC guidelines as a utility, not a security. That's the difference. The coin, the token that you use within the network will not be valid as a security. But it's a service-based architecture that anybody can write secure apps for. End-to-end -end and at-rest at rest encryption. 
asymmetric and symmetric. Um, truly free and open, programmable, multiple languages, multiple operating systems, multiple chipsets. The idea of Demon Saw, but rolled out to the enterprise, um, powered by the blockchain. So here is a very, very rough kind of high level diagram. I won't go through it all. This, I'll put the slides online. Um, I'll work with the Texas Bitcoin Conference to have the, the, the PDF online. We have the ability to build this out today. This is well within our grasp. There's no reason why we can't move forward. Solve privacy, solve secure comms, solve anonymity through a network that incentivizes miners and people who collaborate to the capacity of the network. So these are ways that you can reach me, and we'll have a Q&A here in just a, a second or two. And by the way, I'll be giving out some t-shirts here, some secret t-shirts. So I grabbed a few uh, Demon Saw shirts that I'll be giving out. So uh, those of you brave enough to ask questions might very well get a t-shirt thrown in your direction. Um, but if you want to reach me, um, there's my email, there's my Twitter, um, here's the new uh, site that I'm kind of working on, Promether. Like I said, I'm, uh, I don't want to plug Promether. This is about the blockchain, about Bitcoin in general. But um, I'm looking to build this out, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking for some seed funding right now and uh, an ICO eventually. Um, free and open source, free and open architecture, free and open infrastructure. Uh, you know, no, no EULAs, no terms of service, except this is free to the world. That's what we need. Um, but we need something beyond financial incentives for the blockchain. So thank right. you very much. Um, Big hand for Asia. That's great. Thank you for the presentation. We, uh, we leave plenty of time for questions. We've got 17 minutes. Uh, why don't you kick us off? Well, so I'm a new investor to all this, and the big shock to me was that we don't have the capacity on the blockchain with the ledger to keep it going forever. I had no idea, and I came here and I found this out. So then, in my mind, I go, oh, this is a time value of money thing. If it's going to explode in five years and two months and 17 days, I have to assume that I have to pull my money out of it before that time. What's your response to that? Because I'm just a typical guy with money in uh, Bitcoin right now. Well, it's, it, it's, all, it's all around adoption, right? The more people that get excited about Bitcoin, the, the more people that try to use a decentralized proof of work system, the less it will scale. And what's going to happen, and there are far smarter people in the Bitcoin space than me that can answer this question much better, but what's going to happen if you have an exponential growth of people interested in a technology and wanting to use that technology, and you have a linear growth of the miners in order to support the block ver uh, validation, your transactions are going to take longer and or get pricier. It's the same model that Texas applies here to its toll roads, right? Tolls are fairly low here, but you have people who never go via the toll roads. If tolls get too high, nobody takes the toll roads. If tolls get too low, too many people take the toll roads. So the problem is there's not enough lanes in the highway if you suddenly grow Austin by 20 million people. Um, that is a great analogy to proof of work systems. Eventually, you'll get too many people excited and interested in, in Bitcoin. Um, which is why Vitalik and others are, are pushing for a proof of stake system, because that doesn't require every block to be validated by every miner. So therefore, the question from an investor standpoint is, how far can we keep our money in here based on Wall Street's about to come in, yeah. all these things are about to happen, what's that well, that's... ballpark gray area that's <clears throat> Yeah, well, that, that, that's kind of where it gets more, uh, the market becomes more like Vegas, right? It's like at any given day, you might be fine, you might be fine for months, you might be fine for a couple years. The more conferences like this, uh, well, I think they had a max of 400 here, and then we, we exceeded fire uh, you know, capacity. Um, next year, they'll probably be 600 or 800. And so obviously the interest in this technology is growing. Even American Express is writing white papers now about blockchain. You know, even American Express, as traditional as a company can possibly get, is writing white papers and, and, and submitting patents on the blockchain. So there's no easy answer that I can give you, is, is, is in short. Um, just, just watch. As the interest grows, be weary of proof of work systems would be my answer. OK, next question. Oh, and, uh, oh, and by the way, so large? No, sure. All right, all right. Thank you. Okay. Persistence of data. Yes. Uh, security of the communication is one thing. Do you have provisions for maintaining data over long periods of time, uh, incentivizing that? 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's a great question because the persistence of data, as well as archival and replication and backup, and that that whole that whole need for maintaining records for seven years for compliance or whatever we call it, SOX, PCI compliance, or just versioning, all can be stored in the blockchain. The problem right now is blockchains are expensive to store large quantities of data in them because the block size is either smaller or there's just too much data. What you can do with a system like Prometheur is there's no reason why companies can't take this network, spin up its own blockchain, um, invent its own altcoin just to use internally because all the nodes within the system are going to be service-based. So since your nodes and your architecture is completely service-based, you enable things like end-to-end -end encryption, persistence of data, archival versioning. These become um, merely... Um, uh, these become merely opt-in features of your network. So you don't have to persist the data on the public blockchain for Prometheur. You can have your own internal. That's how companies would solve this problem. And that's how I'd like to license it to companies. All right. I'm sorry? Individual? Individuals as well. Um, uh, I have large, extra large, and 2x. Large, large. okay. All right. All right, next question. All right. All right. I'm sorry if I hit anyone with this. Oh. oh, whoa, I see. That's, uh, that's some strength. I, had, I didn't know I had that in me. Okay, he, he's an question. overachiever. <laughs> so um, I love the commentary about, uh, about proof of work and proof of stake. Um, but of course, with proof of stake, there's always this concern that you can get nodal centralization. Um, what is your take on these DAGs, tangles, and hash graphs that might sidestep that? Well, so, so as I've been a DEF CON speaker for four years, and, and like I said, I know the hacker world is a dangerous place, and people will, for the lulls, destroy others, they, because they can, because they're bored one day and they want to destroy something beautiful, like that scene in Fight Club. Um, that's exactly how the world works. So it comes down to risk. It comes down to risk mitigation, acceptance of risk, and where we stand in that. Um, if you have potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake in, in, a, in a minor or a series of minors. Are you personally going to risk losing all that money because you're gonna mess around? Because you're gonna try to abuse and compromise the, the, the entire uh, system, the entire blockchain. If you're like me, you're not gonna risk your own money. And if it's enough money and the fine is enough for a speeding ticket, some people will not try to speed. So we've seen cities and counties and governments implement similar policies. It doesn't mean people won't speed, but you incentivize them to behave a certain way. I think the penalties have to be high enough such that nobody would want to do that, nobody in their right mind. And they have to have enough coin in escrow in order to be able to mine in the first place. So you can't have just anybody mine. You have to have a stake in the system, and the stake is like an investor is a considerable amount of money, say hundreds of thousands of dollars of coin or millions of dollars potentially of coin. All right, great question. Over large, here. extra large t-shirt. Yeah, I get by you, Tim. Large, extra large. Okay. A question, yes, sir. So as a follow-up on this, in the proof of a stake system, so if someone has sufficiently large stake, mm -hmm. Can they manipulate the system or can, you know, can they misuse the system, someone with sufficiently large stake in the system? And how well, can this be prevented? Well, if, if you have any system where um, somebody has a majority of 51 or more, right, even, even blockchain, even Ethereum, then they could manipulate the entire blockchain, right, because they have majority. Uh, so a lot of white papers say the way to solve this is we prevent anybody from having majority. You know, um, that's an easy solution. But if you have more, 51% or more stake in a system, you own the system. If you have 51% of my company, you own my company and, in effect, own what I can do on a daily basis. It's the same premise applies. So yes, if you own that much, then you can clearly have a majority and you now decide. Now that's why we have hard forks, right? That's why we have the ability to take the code and create our own, create our own blockchain, our own token, our own altcoin with it and move on. Because if we get in a situation where somebody is the majority stakeholder and he or she is not in the best interest of humanity, everyone leaves, everyone migrates. We've seen this with, with hard forks. We've seen this with the DAO, right? The, the DAO hacked, silly, silly recursion error. Shame, shame on you know, 
uh, the Dow for that. But what happened? They just hard forked. And it went against the premise of a free and open blockchain, but they didn't care. You know, they solved it by hard forking or, or rolling back at that, at that point. So we could take a similar approach to roll back or hard fork, et cetera. And I have another question unrelated to this around privacy, in fact. So it seems that the privacy, people definitely want to have that right to exercise, a right to privacy. Yep. But no one cares about exercising that. That's... Uh, well, the... And so, so, and, and, and the reason I say that no one cares about exercising it is how freely we are giving, you know, without reading all the terms and conditions all, on all the different sites. Right. How easily we just let everyone, you know, use whatever they have to do with our data, in fact. Right. So the privacy right now is, privacy is violated on a daily basis, not, in, not just within this country, but all across the world. Um, we don't often hear the voices of the poor and underprivileged. That's the honest truth. We're, we're in a social economical group where we don't hear about examples where people are being abused and taken advantage and mistreated due to privacy and personal human rights violations. We probably get our news from Fox or CNN or MSNBC or The Guardian or RT or some of these other places. Um, the fact that we don't realize privacy is being taken advantage of doesn't mean it doesn't happen, nor does it mean that we shouldn't put provisions in to protect it. Because once it's gone, it's very, very difficult to get back. And as we all know, privacy is pretty much dead for our generations today, right? So anything we do from this point forward to protect privacy is going to be for the future generations. We have given up our privacy for convenience. We've sacrificed control for convenience. We've done it, it's done. We have no more coins to put in this slot machine. But my seven-year-old nephews haven't done this yet. So we think about your kids, your grandkids. That's the generation that we fight for today. And that is the privacy that we aim to protect. Uh, yes. What are you? Uh, what are what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now to make that happen? Oh, that's that's a really good question. Thank you. Well, um, you know, I've I've done software engineering for 20 years. You know, I, I was the security or the, excuse me, the security portfolio architect of American Express. I ran their entire internet and intranet security domains. Um, I built games like Grand Theft Auto V. I made Demon Soft for the past four years. I've spoken at DEF CON. Um, the technology is there. The skill set is there. The hardest thing of bridging that gap from working for a company to being an entrepreneur, especially if you're a technically minded individual, is the business side, is the relationship building, is the networking. So my biggest challenge right now is finding passionate and intelligent investors and partners that share the same vision and can see beyond some of the technical challenges and potential stumbling blocks up front and see a a better world and see a brighter future and see the potential use of a network like this and how it could be the next, the next Ethereum or how it could be the next internet. Um, so really it's, it's finding smart, smart, and there's tons of them out there. But since I'm a, a geek, uh, you know, for me being an entrepreneur is relearning how to walk. And so that is my biggest challenge right now is growing within myself and learning how to talk to investors, and learning how to ask for seed funding, and learning how to bring in people smarter than me that complement me on the business side. So it's really an internal learning process that I've been going through. Um, but the biggest challenge is always the first check for $50,000. That's, that's, that's always it, especially as a geek. Yep. All right, so I'm an investor, I'm not a techno, I'm your complete opposite. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, I came to this conference, and I'm thinking, I got to put money in Bitcoin. Then I hear, of, like, without being redundant, Bitcoin may blow up. But then I also know that the big money is about to line up behind Bitcoin. In fact, uh, one of the things that my friend and I have been talking about is why even consider another ICO. And I'm sure there's reasons to. There's lots of ICOs out there. Um, is there a chance that you can take your idea and bring it so that a hard fork where the money is at, which is at Bitcoin, will go, oh, fuck segregated witness too, let's go with your thing. 
where the money is. And then it would be more uh, interesting for me as an investor if I saw that you had a contract pending with somebody that maybe enough miners that they can make decisions over at Bitcoin. I'd be like, yeah, I want to get on his train. Could you comment about that? Yeah, that's so that absolutely. There's the architecture that I propose today and, and how we merge the blockchain for incentivizing open decentralized networks that can that can secure any type of communication and transfer can fit into any blockchain model that is is going to go to a proof of stake. So it can fit into a Bitcoin that forks and moves to a proof of stake model. It can fit into an Ethereum that forks with Plasma and moves into a proof of stake model. It can be a different altcoin. It can be its own token based model that runs within an ecosystem like an ECR 20 based Ethereum model. Any of that's possible. Um, the good news is um, I'm smart enough as an entrepreneur to recognize unique and good opportunities when I see them. So being open-minded is, is not a problem with me. Um, the important thing, though, is that we build this out and we enable privacy, anonymity, security to be protected while also incentivizing people to build this network bigger. That's what we need in the world. Okay, well, one follow-up? Yeah. Okay, so my idea is that one of the reasons Bitcoin is uh, going to succeed is it has all the money behind it and they don't want it to fail. Mm -hmm. So that even if a more, uh, uh, let's say, technically proficient thing, AKA Ethereum compared to Bitcoin, was to come along, it'll still be 20 billion Ethereum, uh, quadruple billion right. Bitcoin because the money's right. already there. So do you know who to speak to over at the decision-making group in Bitcoin such that you could be the next heart fork? Um. Let's definitely talk about that more offline because it's it's a. I don't think unfortunately it's. I I, I would be doing uh, uh, a disservice by answering that quickly. Okay. Um, there are always more people to talk to. There are always people that will be interested. So yeah, the the answer to that is yes. Um, but uh, I, I have one more T-shirt to give out. Um, does anybody else? This is a two XL. Does anybody else have a? Question. Oh, we got. Uh, we only got time for one more, and then we got 20 minutes set aside where you guys can rush the stage and ask him all your questions one on one. But Ernie, you got the last question, sir. Thank you. My whole goal for this entire thing and why we're going to have you. Yeah, give me. I want my uh, Ernie, shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the ability for private communication that you don't know who communicated? Yeah. Who got it? Yep. That it is totally pirate communication. Yes. Nobody knows what's happened. Now, to do that, this company or whatever you're trying to create here, is that a selling point? Will there be regulatory agencies that will see that and come to you and say, knock on your back door and say, hello, you're not allowed? Are you going to ignore them? The environment that you're in and what you're doing for your, your nephews and your cousins and little people, my grandchildren, this may be the beginning of what the solution is. Mm -hmm. Are you able, prepared, can you resist the forces that will not want you to do that very thing? So another great question. Um, the answer is absolutely. Uh, you cannot have freedom without free will. I grew up in the church. And one thing I learned is that if you are truly going to give a person freedom, free choice, you have to expect him or her to choose poorly from time to time and choose incorrectly or choose something that you don't agree with. Whether it's right or wrong, it's irrelevant possibly. I spent four years building out Demon Saw where I had to answer that question exactly. A year ago, July, at DEF CON 24, I was approached by three NSA agents. And they wanted to find common ground. And that's a quote. How can we find common ground? I said, you need to change your ways. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we find common ground. Now, it was a little bit more than an hour conversation. Um, we all want secure borders. We all want to live our lives in peace, you know, however we desire, without harming others. We are citizens of this country, therefore we are patriots. We enjoy safe borders, we enjoy not being at war, we enjoy not having our lives threatened on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to cooperate not only uh, domestically, but internationally. Nobody wants to wage a war, especially within and against our governments. So they want what we want. They're just going about it the wrong way. 
They're going about it through, I want to collect as much data as possible because they know no other way of stopping terrorists. They're limited in, in their vision and they're limited in their thinking. We aren't. We're visionaries. We're pioneers. We're explorers. Our default state of thinking is an open-minded one. Theirs is closed-minded and regulatory and compliance-driven and you know, reading, reading mandates that were, were sent from generals above. So they naturally don't have the ability to think in the same way that we do. So rather than fight them, we encourage them, we partner with them, but we don't change our core beliefs. And that was why I spent over an hour speaking to these NSA agents. And I said, listen, I am open to go visit NSA and have an open and transparent and honest dialogue because we do need to protect our country from terrorists and foreign powers that wish us harm. But at the same time, we shouldn't be abusing the basic human rights and privacy of our citizens that have done nothing wrong and yet are suspected to be criminals by default. There has to be a balance. If you let us work with you, we can find that balance. Rather than fight you, I think we, if we cooperate, we'll get more done. That's just my opinion. Perhaps it's a bit naive, but that's at least where I think we should start. Um, All right. So that's the conversation I had with them. <laughs> Go ahead, Ernie. Thank you. Is to find this. You have private communication, email, texting, anything that is, I can communicate, send files, attach whatever to be private. Right. There are a lot of freedom oriented, peaceful. We don't want to take over anything. We just want to be left alone, mostly defending themselves against governments all over the world. Yep. You do that, there is a shitload of money from there, too. Yeah, well, the good, the good news is I spent the last four years perfecting that model through Demon Saw. Do you know today people in China use Demon Saw and it punches right through the Great Firewall? So much for the greatness of their firewall. Um, they can use it to do secure communications and file sharing right through a firewall. People use it from within their companies. You can share your entire C drive if you want from within your corporation. I don't recommend it. It usually results in dismissal. But uh, nonetheless, that's the power that I've built in. And that same power, 10 times greater, will be in Prometheur. So there will be no problem with individuals having the right to express themselves through great firewalls in the future. Great. All right, one more big hand. Thanks, guys. Thank